going to get back into more away from general things you could take with you to any place you ever go back down to kind of Baocat itself and, and the resources we have here on campus. Um, you have to generalize a little bit here. I'm going to talk about queuing systems. Uh, your desktop PC that you have at home, who's in charge of that? You are. Who's in charge of Baocat? Not you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, of course, we would really like it if everybody could, ju could jump on, and I'm not even kidding, we would like it if everybody could get on and have all their jobs run, starting right away, and working immediately, and finishing as soon as possible. That's what we try to get as much as possible, but we have too many people wanting too few resources, so we have to have a way of managing that, and that's what Adam and I do a lot of, is managing that. Um, so you have what's called a queuing system. And it's actually similar to the old mainframe days where you submit a batch job and it works on it a while and, and it comes back. So that's what we do. We uh, submit and process jobs according to what's called the scheduler. Our scheduler is called SGE, which originally stood for Sun Grid Engine. Now Oracle took over Sun, and we use an open source offshoot of it called Sun of Grid Engine, so it's still called SGE. Uh, but it's a, it, it, it's just a, a, one, of the, one of the many systems out there that allows people to submit jobs, figure out when is the best time for them to run, and to execute them, and try to do it in a fair way. And fair is different to every person out there because, of course, fair is mine runs first! I know how that works. So we, uh, we try to do that as much, like I say, we, we really try to do that as much as possible, try to get everybody's job in as quickly as possible. And we have philosophical discussions uh, when we see things in the queue that have been sitting there for a while of, okay, is that fair? How do we make it fair? We're tweaking things fairly frequently, fairly frequently. It tends to be in spurts. We'll, we'll tweak a little bit for a couple, three weeks, and then it'll stay that way for months at a time, that type of thing. But I will say also just one interjection. Uh -huh. Um, if you've got something significant, like, look, I have a paper deadline and I have to get this through the system, or I have a class that I'm teaching, for instance, I was just changing emails with uh, some of your bosses, um, Dr. Akins, and she's got a class on computational chemistry where, look, she needs to be able to run the class exercises, we can reserve notes. If you come in and say, I need 100 notes for the next three months, I'm going to be very, very distressed. But if you say, look, I just need, you know, I need some notes because I've got a peak coming through. I just need to make sure these things get through in a very timely fashion. Give me a holler and let's see what we can work out. So particularly, for instance, for her class, she doesn't need that many notes. I'll just take a slice of Baocat, dedicate it to her class for a month. Sure, piece of cake. It's really easy. And so if you have unusual demands or needs, uh, let's see what we can work out and go from there. So particularly for the faculty members that maybe have a deadline where if I don't get these results done, I'm going to miss this, this conference deadline or the journal paper deadline. Or an SF deadline. <laughs> or an SF deadline. Uh, let's see what we can do. Everybody wins when you get your results done and you get more money and then come back later and say, hey, can I contribute to Baocat? So uh, I have a vested interest in making sure you're successful. To be fair, it is also very hard to do some of that at the very last minute. So if you, right. if yeah. you know ahead of time, let us know. We can we can try and get something worked out. We we have been asked for the physically impossible, um, which is difficult to accomplish. 
and uh, we've also been asked for things that would require us to kill off you know, half the jobs that are currently running on Beocat, and that's something that I'm probably not going to be willing to do. So, but you know, give us some time to work, and it can usually be accommodated. We are looking into, this is preemptive scheduling. This is something we've looked at, we have not gotten done yet. And that is a system where we've had a lot of, we've had people that have not contributed to Beocat because they want their jobs to be able to run now. And they've got the money to do it, and so that's the way they're going to do it. We're looking at a system where uh, it's all, all within the schedule that we have now, where you have your resources that you bought in and you say, this is what I, whenever I need my resources, I need them now, and we can have people running on them at that point, and we'll, we'll basically schedule low-priority jobs, more or less, on there. And uh, so that way, if somebody comes along and says, okay, I need to use these machines now, we can fill those off, reschedule them, and you get access to your stuff right now. That's long-term plan, we're not there yet. But, and I, and I went through some of this <coughs> seamless plug, centralizing resources, again, because there's, the typical cycle is, you use it really heavily for a while, and then you don't. And more than likely, by centralizing this, your peak is not gonna be your peak, and your peak is not gonna be your peak, and we can kind of average out the, the hills and the valleys there, and, uh, and, and, and make it better for the, for the entire university. We really do try to accommodate everybody that we can. We, we, we try to get jobs here quickly, we try to help people out with, you know, if they're having problems, even even coding problems, to whatever we can we can do. It. We're, we try to be really customer friendly, so to speak. We try to do the best we can with what we got, and we hope that we're not seen as that group of Jesus. Hey, have to deal with them again. If you get to that point, let let us know. We'll try to do something about it because that's really problem we're trying to avoid. I've got kind of a, a schematic here of Beocat, and even scaling it down a bit, it's got a little small. Um, this is kind of a high-level overview of what we got. We've got the campus network, the internet comes into the outside, it comes to the Nickel Halls router, and that comes to everything within this box here is the Beocat, what happens in the Beocat server room. And we're going to go on a tour here in just a few minutes, for those of you who haven't seen it yet. Um, it comes to our firewall. And there we have several different networks internally that we deal with. Uh, one you guys don't have to mess with is the management network over here in the green. And I label that in green on purpose because I think all of our management cables are green. So that helps us to realize, you know, as we're plugging and unplugging things, where things go. Um, those go into all the different machines all across the network. We have the purple is the production network. Got my, my key here. I have it written down elsewhere also. Um, the red is, is some hosted VMs. We have several people that we just run virtual machines for. They're running web servers and uh, GIS applications and some other things that by, by putting them on a separate kind of network, they can have ultimate control of their own machines without being able to take ultimate control of our other machines, which we don't want them to do. Uh, OpenStack is in blue over here. OpenStack is a, is a new system that we're going to. Uh, we're dedicated, dedicating some resources to. OpenStack is basically like uh, Amazon's uh, EC2 cloud, more or less. It's a, you, you can fire up a virtual machine. Uh, it, right now, we have it targeted at students in a particular class. We're hoping to expand that out once we make sure that everything works correctly. Um, to, more general use across campus. Fire up a, you can fire up and fire down a, a virtual machine at your leisure, having some known space out there, using the resources that we have here, as opposed to having to use your own for, especially for, uh, you know, we got UPSs and backup systems and all that kind of stuff in place. So that's the idea on that. Our production network goes, goes to all our compute nodes, everything here. And then we have uh, OpenStack talks to Ceph, which is a new uh, 
disk system, we kind of have a few resources set to the side for the disk on there. The main disks talk to two file servers. That, that helps us keep some really high availability by having two file systems talking to the same disks. And all of these guys are talking, the orange here, again on purpose because that's the color of the cables, are uh, InfiniBand, which is the very high speed uh, uh, network that we have that's used to talk to for file storage. It's what the OpenMPI open runs across, your MPI stuff runs across. And it's uh, very low latency. It also runs at 40 gigabits per second, for those of you guys who like networking stuff. It's fast, very low latency, very fast. That's why we use it to talk to disks and such. Hardware-wise, we currently have, as of the writing of this, and I think it's actually changed since I wrote this a couple weeks ago, we have 156 compute nodes, 10 OpenStack nodes, and 18 infrastructure servers. Um, kind of have that broken out here and talk about this a little, little bit. Um, this is how many users we've got on the system. Dan just sent me these today. Got them in my slides. Um, between 2003 and 2011, went from about 10, 15 users in 2003. Now we have somewhere north of 300. <coughs> More like 500 now. That was 2011. We're up yep. in the 500 oh, yeah. range of last year. So. Obviously, this is becoming something that more and more people are using. We like that. If we're here, we might as well be, you know, use us. That's what we're here for. Number of cores in the system just crossed the 200 threshold in 2008, and now we're actually over 2,000. That this only goes to 2010. We're over 2,000 now. The compute nodes that we have, we have four classes that are currently in service. First one are the scouts. Uh, those of you who've been, this is kind of aimed for those of people who uh, have used the system, you have used it before, so you kind of know what, what's going on here. We have 76 of those. We've got a whole bunch of them really inexpensive from Sun. They're the oldest ones we have in production. They are not the fastest guys on the block, but we have lots of them. That's not all bad. There are a lot of jobs that we have come through that actually don't need that much CPU <coughs> horsepower. They need things to run for a very long time. These work fantastic for that kind of stuff. Um, they're running eight cores of piece, two four core optrons at 2.3 gigahertz and at eight gigs of RAM. It's really sad I'm coming from the private world and an eight gig RAM server. I'm going, wow, that's pretty good. And here, that's the old slow stuff, is what we're dealing with now. Next oldest one is the Paladins. Uh, we have 16 of those. They're running two six core. Uh, Xeons at 2.93 gigahertz. That's you know, 12 cores each. 24 gigs of RAM. I left that in there. I meant to take it out. Sorry. Uh, these are the ones that we do have the uh, the uh, GPUs in. They have the Tesla GPUs, and they have InfiniBand. So this is the only ones we have that have InfiniBand, or uh, that have uh, GPUs in them are the Paladins. So if you're interested in GPU computing, these are the ones. You're, if if you tell it you're going to run CUDA, these are the ones they will go on. So you may want to be knowing about the CPU limitations. They're still not slow by any stretch, but they're not the fastest things out there available. Next we have our big ones. I like these guys. <laughs> these have eight 10 core CPUs, 2.4 gigahertz, with a terabyte of RAM apiece in InfiniBand. These are the ones we mainly got for bioinformatics use. Um, we said there's six, there's actually 12, but they're tied together at the CPU level. So you'll see two boxes in there, and that, those two boxes together will make one mage. That's why we, if, you, if you happen to notice what job, if you happen to be running on a mage and you're looking what job, it's always going to be an odd number. We have one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. That's so we can break them apart and make two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve if we ever wanted to. But as they're tied together, they're all the odd numbers. And we have the ILs. We have 38 in production. More that we're waiting on cables for and, and a switch. And so we'll have some more of these in place. These are 16 core, 2.9 gigahertz. They're the Sandy Bridge. For those of you that keep up on CPU technologies. That's the fastest readily available CPU from Intel. I say readily available because like you said, there are the fives, but you've got to show them that you really need them before they let you have any of those. And they're quite expensive even if you do. 64 gigs of RAM, again, not, not as much as the mages, but still nothing to sneeze at. 
And again, they have antenna bands on there too. And with that, yeah, yeah it's been good. <coughs> we'll we'll uh, come back to the what I had before there. Yeah, just to figure out how many at a time here. Yeah, because I'm thinking if we take 35 people through at once, then you'll hear this big squeaking noise, which is my voice from the front of the line, and uh, nothing else, nothing at all towards the back. Um, tell you what, why don't we do? We'll just do. Let's divide it in thirds. thirds, I think, yeah. probably. And then, um, actually, so maybe we just take one, two, three, and you guys can each grab a group of about ten. We'll just kind of go through, and you can talk about the different notes. And okay. Point, and we'll go from there. So, uh, I think we get, let's see here. I think we have to have a reasonable way to do <laughs> we're this. Pre we're pretty uh, closely <laughs> spread out. Just pick whoever's closest and come toward the... Sure, okay. Uh, about <laughs> ten of you form up on me, and then we'll go take the tour, and then we'll go from there. We'll be, back in, we'll be back in this room in about, well, you know, five minutes or so. And if you want to leave your stuff here, that's fine. We'll lock the door. So, group of ten. Two, four, six, eight, ten-ish. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> send an email either to the support list or to Dan. If, we, if you send it to us, we send it to Dan, and he has to approve it, and then we create the accounts. And if you send it to Dan, then he still has to send it to us anyway, so it doesn't matter. It's got to go back and forth one or the other anyway. Um, I'm, do I need to go over how to log in? You know, Kat, I think everybody here, raise your hand. Don't feel shy. If you, if you don't know, we can definitely go over it. You're not? I always thought you were had a guilty look on your face. No, I know. All right. <laughs> there are a few people, Kyla. I think. I think. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to use Cuddy here. No. You saw me do a little bit earlier here. Um, the SSH command would be what you'd use within a terminal window on either Linux or OS 10. But I'm just going to run Cuddy. And where it says hostname or IP address over here, we're going to put in bayocat.cis.ksu.edu. Everything other defaults should be just fine on this. Uh, some of the older versions of Putty did not default to tell, did not default to SSH. So if you have an older version of Putty, you have to change that one. And we click on open. And you can also save this. So all you have to do is double click it over. Here, so like double click instead of where it says default settings, I can make one that says Bayocat. Matter of fact, let's just do that. Bayocat. Save. Now I can just double click this. Double click. The double oh. click only loads the settings. It only loads it? Alright. Yep. Still got to click open. Alright. Then after this point, it uses your EID, username and password, when it, once it connects. It says login as, I'm going to use my EID, <coughs> Kyle Hudson, and my password, which is, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Why 
one, one really neat thing is that the password gets updated with all the case state passwords. So you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that. we just we just hook into the main system. That works right. well. I, I will I will say, Kyle, one time I was teaching in class and I didn't quite hit return as vigorously as I thought. And I started typing my password after my username and got about three quarters away through my password and showed it to the entire class, which was mildly embarrassing and scary, and I changed it immediately after class. My, so my last password change was about two weeks ago, and I did something very similar, and it was only Adam watching, but I still changed it right afterwards anyway. Not that I don't trust Adam, but I'd have taken all his money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it said my password and command not found, I said, ah, oh, shoot. <laughs> so, I just made this bigger so you can see it on, on, on the screen here, but uh, this, is, this is what you see when you first log in. And it's, it's just sitting there ready for you, for you to tell it what to do. We're going to go over some of that. Um, when you first log in, you log into one of the head nodes. They're named Athena and Minerva. All of our systems are named after Greek mythological characters. It, it, the reason why is because we have a lot of systems <coughs> that seems to be a limitless supply of Greek mythological characters. So they're, they're sometimes they have deeper meaning than what, what's there, and sometimes it's just because of what came up. So uh, Athena and Minerva are the, are the two head nodes. The head nodes are the ones you log into from the outside world. They are the ones you submit jobs from. Um, you can even run programs on them. We do have limits on that because uh, they start right away. Uh, we had somebody who was doing a lot of testing and she was submitting jobs that would run for 15 seconds. And I, had, I said, why are you doing this? Because I was, I was working with her on a problem. Something, we, we had a particularly busy time in Bayocat and her jobs wouldn't be scheduled for about two hours. And she was complaining, you know, well, that was a really short job, why wasn't it getting scheduled? Well, you were just running testing on this, so there's no reason to even need to schedule that. You can run it right there from the head node, from Athena Minerva. So, but we do have limits on that. Uh, one gig of RAM, one hour of CPU time, use it mostly for testing. The, you know, or if you have really short type stuff, the, the things, that, the <coughs> examples I've been giving today, I've been doing those all on the head node too. No. The, the memory limitation is actually four gigs. Oh, is it? Yes. Okay. It's a four gig limitation on memory. It, it's a quick kill, though. So as soon as you hit four gigs, it, that, that, that process gets killed. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that, no manual intervention required. Yes. So, so if you do have short jobs, if you are doing system testing to see how things work, that's, that's perfectly valid. And we expect that. No big deal. Okay, what happened when you submit a job? I like that I passed English class or typing class one or two. What happens when you submit a job? It goes, it goes into the queue. It goes in, right, it goes into the queue, and the scheduler figures out when is the best time that I can run this job. And deep and mysterious and very strange things happen. Yes. <laughs> That's about the best I can tell you. Deep and mysterious things happen. Um, the way you submit a job is through the QSub, the QSub command. That is the SGE submission process. All their jobs begin with Q, so that's how you can generally tell if something is a is an SGE process or not is by starting with a Q. We'll talk about a little bit about that in just a minute. We're, actually, tour took a little longer than I thought it was going to, so we're going to rush through here a little bit. Um, if you go to this web page here, this this. If you click on Sun Create Engine from the main page, it'll take you to this page to support CIS at ksu.edu slash bacat docs slash Sun Create Engine. That gives you pretty much everything you need to know or could possibly want to know about submitting jobs to Bayocat. Um, it tells you about multi core environments. Yes, ma'am? Uh, quick question How do I know how many run I require? That's a good question, actually. <laughs> um, generally, uh, if, if you run, have a short test, you can run it on, on a head node and kill it off. Um, if, it, if, you, if it's gonna, not going to hit the 4 gig mark. I don't know. But, uh, like, I have the code, but how uh -huh. do I measure it? Like, uh, like, like, computer science up, question. Uh, right. You might, you might pull up a window and talk to them about something like HTOP or some other, uh, or some of the other tools that can tell you how much memory you're actually using. 
But they can't run these jobs. Yeah, they can. They can't log into the node though to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You can log into there. I thought, I thought as long as you're as long as you're running a node. So normally, normally you can't log in directly to the compute node, which is kind of what this discussion is about. Uh, just because we don't want people running directly, we want you to log into the head node and then run it. However, if you are running a job, so there are two ways of actually getting on a compute node. One is if you have a job that you're running on the on a compute node, you can log into that compute node. And so just to monitor, it, the intent is you can monitor your jobs and take a look at them, that sort of thing. The other thing is to use, uh, you can use a command called instead of qsub, you can use a command called qrsh, which just gives you a shell on a particular compute node, and, you can, and it's just like a normal qsub, and you can just work on it from there. But in this case, I'll just go there and just do, yeah, like you sh probably, yeah, well you can. But in general, if you, mage hstop is gonna be huge. Yeah, yeah that's not exactly. good. That's why I was doing that. Well, it's, it's fun, but it shows you. <laughs> Let me turn off the lights here, and then we'll talk about hstop. This is a fun tool, and I, I'm these guys' boss, so I can oh. interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, for users mm -hmm. to get a hold of nodes and that kind of stuff, we, there's, a, there's a command called monitor node. And put monitor with capital M and node with capital N. And it's all probably only on, well, no, it's only on the head nodes. Punch you. So I can't do it. I'm not running any jobs though. You're right. You are not. <laughs> and it's got checks for that. It checks to make sure okay. that your jobs are just done. Just run H stop, would you? There we go. Okay. So H stop looks like this. And you can run it on a particular node. And I end up using this a lot, which is one of the reasons that I said, hey Kyle, pull this up. And you can blithely ignore this if you don't want to. So it does a couple of cool things for you. Um, the first thing it does is it tells you up here, it gives you a little text-based bar graph of what the CPUs are doing on each of these. In this case, they're doing practically nothing. Um, however, there are a couple things to look at. One of which is the red, this is time that's spent in the system. The green is the time it's, spend, it's spending doing like uh, core three here, you can see it's 100%, um, is the time it's spent doing user code. Normally for your programs, you wanna be able to run HTOP, you want lots of green, and very little red, because red means the operating system and the computer are doing stuff for you. Normally, if you've got lots of red, it means something is going badly wrong. Occasionally, there are really good reasons for it, but usually that's a bad sign. It means that you've got multiple threads and they're all fighting over who gets to use what piece of data, they're sending lots of data or something like that, and not actually getting the work done for you. So, a couple things. To answer your question, Perla, mm -hmm. one of the things you can do is you look at memory, and you can say, hey, how much of this is Am I using here? And it's saying we're using, um, what is that, about 1.2 gigabytes out of 16 gigabytes, if I'm interpreting this correctly. And the green stuff is the kind you're looking at. And so that gives you overall for that particular node how much it's using. And then you can also look down here and say, okay, let's look at the various jobs. So KW Jordan has a bunch of nodes that are running. Root's running one, Nora's got some, got some here. <coughs> I have no idea who Lele is. Right there? Hey, there you are. Um, is on here. And it'll tell you some things. Most of the time, you can ignore priority. It changes, and it doesn't really matter on the head node because you don't have to worry about priority. But we also talk about how much virtual memory you're using, how much resident memory you're using. This is getting into the numbers you were wondering about. Mm -hmm. How much resident memory you've got, how much shared memory, which is kind of you're using shared libraries and that sort of thing. But these things can give you kind of an idea of, okay, how much memory is my system using? I would probably be looking at the virtual and the, and the resident. Resident is what's actually pulled up in the RAM. Virtual is kind of be, gonna be the total that you're actually using. And then, what's your CPU percentage look like? Like here, nobody's doing anything, so everything's at zero. But it can tell you how much of a CPU, what percentage are we actually using? So a lot of times, for instance, if your CPU percentage is sitting at 20%, then if your code is running hard, then but you're only using 20% of a core, that probably means your code is waiting a lot. It's waiting for the hard drive to get you the data, that sort of thing. So maybe you need to balance more and say, you know what, instead of reading a bunch of small little reads off of a file, maybe you should get big hunks. Same sort of thing when you're when you're dealing with working off of reading off the hard drive as we're dealing with the network is fewer bigger hunks tend to work a lot faster than a bunch of little teeny hunks of data either reading or writing. So I tend to look at this. Uh, time you can usually ignore, it's the total time it's been running, and then you can figure out exactly what the commands were that people, uh, that you were running and that sort of thing. Does that help? So, 
Okay, so this is, so to answer your question, this would probably be the first tool I would look at, but there are others out there. Yeah. But then you, you, you need to first log into the compute node. Right. If you're running on the compute node or if you're testing on the head node, then just run HTOP and go from okay. there. So a lot of times I would have two putty windows open, okay. one of which is actually I'm running my code, and a second putty window that's running HTOP. And that way I can okay. be running my code and I can be seeing, hey, what are these what are these bars doing and does it look like it's working well or not? Okay. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the Q, Q sub command, uh, let's, there are tons of uh, options for that you can uh, submit on, uh, for Q sub commands. If we go here, again, this is the main BayoCap page to Sun Grid Engine. Most common thing you'll see is uh, memory and time. This person here, they took the option of four gigs of, of RAM. They wanted InfiniBand and a runtime of two hours. This, this is the PE, the, M, the parallel environment. <coughs> if you're not running MPI, it's single. In this case, they wanted MPI one dash with two nodes of MPI-1. That means you're reallocating one at a time. The MPI-1 means you're allocating one at a time. Two means a total of two of those. So now, the one thing to know if you're re requesting multiple cores is this is per core. We've had people that wanted to use an entire mage. So they said, I want 80 cores and a terabyte of RAM, which is fine. We can. It'll take a while to get scheduled, but it'll it'll go. Except when they uh, when they been realized they were asking for a terabyte per core, and we don't have any machines that have 80 terabytes of RAM, so the job never got scheduled. The runtime uh, once it once your job reaches this runtime, it will get killed off. So don't underestimate your runtime. <laughs> yes. Do you have to request a runtime? If you don't, it defaults to an hour. Okay. Well. And it'll run for an hour and it'll quit. And matter of fact, that's on our fact page because we've had lots of people say, hey, my job will run for an hour and it'll stop. That's because you didn't ask for more than that in runtime and that's the default. It ran for one hour, kept going, it quit. Don't, ask, don't underestimate your runtime. The, if, if you're going to err in one direction, overestimate your runtime. Um, there are disadvantages to that. It becomes harder to schedule when you overestimate your runtime. Especially if you do it by an order of magnitude, which we've had people do that. Um, the other thing is we run into maintenance periods. For instance, we have a maintenance period scheduled for next Monday. We have some maintenance needs to be done. And we're going to take everything down for a, a couple hours. We had several people ask me this last week, why didn't my jobs run? Well, because the scheduler knows that this maintenance period is coming up next Monday, and you said you were going to use 12 and a half days. It doesn't have any way of knowing that you really only needed five, that, that you were overestimating by that scale. So therefore, their job's not going to run until after the maintenance period is over. So that, that's kind of the disadvantage of overestimation. You obviously, the closer you can get it to being right, the better you are. But don't underestimate, because if, if you've asked for you know, a week of runtime and it takes a week and an hour to run your program, you've just probably lost part of that. The side question back there. Kyle, does this, um, does this also take into account the time that the job is sitting in the queue, waiting? No, that's, that's from the time your job starts to the time it ends. Is, is there any wiggle room? I've, I've had cases where I schedule jobs for a week, and then uh -huh. it cuts me short, and then I have to wait for six days and 20 hours. And I know it's, it's, it, it shouldn't make a big difference, but I've had, I've had a, a couple of jobs like that. Does that sound familiar? If you could get us some job numbers, we can take a look, because okay. I've not seen that before. Okay. 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 In theory, it shouldn't happen. In reality, it may. Okay. <laughs> like I said, the, and the other thing people do is they, they'll request MPI when they don't, 
they just think that that's going to get them more quarters, and that does not help if that's your job specifically. We'll use MPI. Matter of fact, it'll cause things not to work correctly. Question back there? I don't know. Why do you request an band and why would you not? What's the difference between? I've never actually used that. By, de by default, it's off. Okay. Uh, InfiniBand is primarily for MPI jobs. Okay. So that you can talk over MPI over that super fast network. Okay. You can talk MPI over the, uh, the, the switch network, the production network, but it's not as fast. Okay. But you don't. If you're not running MPI, that does gives you no advantage anyway. Okay. Um, several other things here. I'm I'm not even going to go through most of these things. CUDA, that's for the GPU nodes. Um, <coughs> InfiniBand or IB. Uh, slots. You notice that what I emphasized earlier, it's right here on our page. BayoCat will not magically thread your applications. When we, we, keep, we put those as many places as we can. We still have people try it. Getting close to time here. Let's see what else I had. Uh, I do have a sample uh, QSub. Um, you can make a QSub file, which I do here. This is one I just made up. Uh, I, again, I was having to create several of these, so it seemed to me to kind of make one kind of general and, and kind of explain what we're doing here. So normally on, on, on a shell script, which is what this is, uh, a, a, a hash at the beginning of the line is a command. But QSub will take a hash dollar sign as a command for QSub itself. So I make two hashes at the beginning of the line. And that way you can comment on one. So, yeah, again, feel free to copy this. That I have it in my directory. Say again, you, you have two hush. Uh, yeah, on, on the beginning of the line here. That way I can comment out. So that way you can take this file, comment out one of the hashes, and have it work being hash, dollar sign, okay. and then the rest of the command. Okay. You might demonstrate that. How am I going to demonstrate that? <laughs> <laughs> Right. So if I was going to, <laughs> maybe we should use nano so we can actually see it. Make myself use nano. I know. If it doesn't do some coloring too, and there we go. Okay. So to instead of activate any of these lines, then I'd go like this. If I wanted to actually okay. say, specify memory one gig, which is the default anyway, so that would, but I could go here and say six gigs is what I want. And I don't want one hour of runtime. I want seven hours of runtime. And especially note the uh, underscore per core per round, which occasionally leads to weird math, but you have to do it. Yes. So. Anyway, I put in, the, like I said, the most common ones that we see here, here in the sample. So all you got to do is comment out that first hash on here and submit your job. Um, different parallel environments. The default is is single and one. So if you had a non-MPI job, and, but which is using like OpenMP, which could use 12 cores, for instance, I could do this one, and now it's set for 12 cores. The different MPI jobs we're going to get into in the next hour, uh, different MPI schemes. Um, that actually isn't working right now, so ignore that. Um, you can all do all sorts of things. I've tried to tried to comment them all in this file. Just some of the more common things people have done: naming a job, uh, running what what job we're running, changing directories, uh, giving names for your output, that type of thing. I'm going to exit without saving. <laughs> so again, that's in this thing directory over here, the Bayocat intro directory. Feel free. To copy that, rename it. I I put it out there for your use. I've had it out there in my home directory for a while, but now that I have a an audience that might actually find it, even better. I don't know if you're planning on doing this, but 
Would there happen to be a script that can tell you when the job that's in the queue is expected to run? That was actually the next thing on my list, actually. <laughs> we, we uh, as sysadmins, we use a command called QSTAT all the time, which will give you a list of what jobs are in the queue. Um, and normally I have my screen very large, so this all fits on one line instead of two. But this is telling me the job number, the username, the program they're running, and how many cores they want as a quick uh, example. There is a command which was written by our very own Adam Tigert. <coughs> Sat status with a U. I, I didn't write that one. You didn't write status? No. Oh, you wrote the... I wrote QSCED. QSCED. I'm trying to give you credit here, man. <laughs> uh, let's say that's because it's not running. Well, why is that? Aha. By default, status will give you all of your own jobs. I don't have any jobs sitting out there right now, so I have to tell it. Give me the status of that particular job. Why is that not running? Thanks. <laughs> User, let's try this. The last one out there. There we are. <laughs> he has errors on his. Not trying to point anybody out here, but <laughs> since he's here, this will tell you that this last job, this uh, the previous one that we can see up here, it was submitted this afternoon at 1:22. Now, if it's all working, we've been having problems with the scheduler, which is why we have the maintenance period the next week, so I promise this will work. I promise that it should work after we're done with the maintenance period. We can say one, two, 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 nine, oh, four. That one may not show up just because it's small, I think. Oh, only requested one core, right? Yeah. Yeah. Try the next one. And it's probably fairly short. Look for something larger, like the NGSCOs. 870 there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like I said, we've been having problems with the scheduler. That's the reason. This would normally tell you when that when this job right here, this 12, 2, 8, 7, 8, 870, a job here, it would normally tell you when it is scheduled to run. Uh, summary queue stat when you have many jobs on the queue and you want to know how many are running, how, how many are, are on the queue. Um, that status command? Yes. Do you have, do you have several in there right now? I have a few. <laughs> there. Mm -hmm. that, that'll tell you your submit time mm -hmm. and your, and any time, if you had any running, it would tell you it yeah. started running at this point. It won't to, the, it doesn't do the same job as QSCED that tells you when it is scheduled to run. Right, but so, sometimes I have more than what the screen will allow me. Uh -huh. and, and I don't want to go down and count them. Do you have such a thing as a summary which will say at the bottom you have this, this many jobs running, this many jobs scheduled? Word count? <laughs> okay. So you've got 29 lines? Okay. <laughs> That's going to give you pretty close. <laughs> So those are going to be all my running jobs. There is um, in other high, high performance computing facilities that I have worked with, they, they had a, other functions. And I think it was something like, boy, something like status, where you would get the listing of your jobs that are running, mm -hmm. and at the bottom, a line that says there are this many jobs running. Then a listing of the jobs that are on the queue, and, 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 and a line that says you have this many jobs in the queue, so that you can see not, not only what jobs, but how many jobs, which I've been running in the hundreds. And I think we could probably write yeah. something that would just summarize this fairly easily. 
My, my guess, my guess is that they were probably running a different scheduler that had that command built in or something okay. like it. On the other hand, um, if you would send an email to Daocat at CIS saying, "Hey, could we have this?" and we'd like it to look like X, my guess is that'd be pretty easy for these guys to script up and it would be pretty cool. Okay. That okay. should be Thank yeah. You. That should be pretty quick and easy. Thank you guys. So that list tells which ones are running, or are those if just a schedule? It, it'll actually tell you both if they are in the queue and if they are running. In this case. They're, this is all on submit time. Okay. It, it will say on there, let's find one that's running here. Who has running jobs? Chung has running jobs. Instead of saying submit time, what well, else said submit time here? This one says start time. And it'll tell you what queue it's running in. We'll tell you what what node it's scheduled to. It'll tell you what queue it's running. Yes. Is there a way to limit the number of characters that displays the name of the job? I don't think so. Is there a what? Way is changing like the length of this? Yeah. I don't think so. No. Use a smaller name. <laughs> Not to the best of my knowledge. But again, this is all open source software, so I mean, I can't see any reason why we couldn't. I mean, this is obviously a, uh, a an abbreviation in there. It's probably a constant built in somewhere. And it may be just because I have a smaller screen, too. I, I haven't tried this out. I, I normally run with screens that are this big that are all text based. I got a 27 inch monitor, and it's all just running terminal sessions. So I've never noticed that. Maybe, maybe it would work. It would show the whole thing online. I don't know. So we have QStat, QSCED, status. We'll, we'll give you your own. And then the only other things that you may need to deal with is we had somebody <laughs> who submitted one point. Was that you submitted one point four million jobs? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, they got through about 100,000 of them and then realized something was wrong. So you can use the QDEL. I won't use this for real because I don't have a job I want to kill. But you can run this on your own jobs and you can delete your jobs from the queue. It will only work on your own jobs. <laughs> What's that? I said it will only work on your own jobs. Yes. Unless I do it. <laughs> or Adam does it. <laughs> yeah. Did I just delete that? Delete everything? That delete, well, I would give it a job number. So I would say, like, if I wanted to kill that one, I'd say, Kill one two 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 nine oh six or Q Del one one two nine oh six. And that would you you can also give it a <laughs> user and tell it would kill all the jobs for that user, but that's probably not what any of you want. <laughs> <laughs> there is one more command here that so you may use occasionally and it's Q alter. Yes. So sorry, you you can you can kill all the jobs for a user or, or you have to kill them one by one? Yeah. Can't can't you kill and there are jobs that are starting, that have a job name starting with a certain, you know, a certain number of characters. I don't think you know those. Think so. I think we, we, quite frankly, we'd probably script that. We'd do a list of them and then okay. say, delete okay. that one, delete that one, delete that one, and okay. make yeah, it all happen yeah. that way. If you had something like that, probably just quick email to the video cat. Okay. Yeah. Folks would be the simplest way to do it. Okay. Thank you. Gotcha. Um, you can use the Q alter command. You can change. The resources you listed, let's say you submitted a job as uh, MPI fill, which will take one node and try to use as many cores on that one as it can, and then it'll take the next one and use as many cores on that one. And you said, no, that's not what I wanted. I wanted MPI spread. MPI spread will take and spread out across as many nodes as you possibly can. You can use the QAlter command to do that. Again, those are documented on the, on the SunGrid Engine pages. Um, you can only change those once a before a job has started, once you've submitted to the queue, but before it started. Once a job has started, its parameters are set, and therefore it shall ever more be. We do have, we have had several people ask me, can you increase the time on my job? Because it's not going to finish in the time that I thought it was going to. Generally speaking, the answer is no. If it's really, really important and important for get your research done and maybe if it's running for three weeks and you need another couple days we can probably make it happen but it requires killing off everything else on that node so 
it's a pretty drastic measure for that to happen. So we try to do that as little as possible. Uh, the reason they don't let you change the parameters on that once it started is because it'd be really easy to game the system. Start up, say, yeah, I need an hour. Oh, just kidding, I need 300 hours. <laughs> so we don't, we don't allow that to happen, but they don't even allow us to make that change as, as system administrators. It's, it's pretty drastic if we want to change, you know, if we want to let a job go past the, the time that, that we have. So once again, don't underestimate your time that you, that you need it for. If it finishes early, our system's perfectly happy to say, hey, look, we can move things up. <laughs> That's what I had for, uh, yes? Is there an option to uh, get notified when a job is finished, like send them, get an email or something? Yes, like that? uh, that's, uh, if, if you looked at my submit queue, I have to think, nano central. <laughs> There's a, it's a dash capital M, I believe. It's a, you want a lowercase m and a capital M, because capital M gives you a, a, the email address to send it to, the lowercase m uh, tells you when to send it, tells the scheduler when to send it. I don't have that in here, I should. I will update this shortly but to put that in there because I have several people that do that. And it's really handy, I've done that on my own jobs to, to uh, you know, have it send you an email when it's done and when it's starting and that kind of thing. The, uh, the lowercase m, if you're, if you're wondering, you have a, b, and e. It's abort, begin, and end. Those are the times that it would send it. So. Good question over here. Uh, is there a way to uh, automatically set the number of calls based on the availability? Like if I assign uh, a team, uh, That we're going to cover in the next hour. Actually, that's one of the things we, we're going to be talking about is, is a variable number of cores, depending on what we can get. So stick around. We'll get there. Any other questions, comments, or snipe remarks? Nobody ever comes up with a snipe remark when you ask for it. <laughs> yes? So can we S window to the Bellcat? To X the window to Bellcat, yeah. yeah. To the head node. To the head node. That's it. You, you, you can't run X job, you can't run X applications on a node, on, on another node. We don't have X on any of the nodes themselves, only the head nodes. And so they are limited to the four gig of RAM limits and the one hour CPU time. The what? Oh, let's uh, see if I understand here. You're saying RQ? Yeah. That is resubmitted and queued. So probably if something a node died or something like that. So R is resubmitted, Q is Q. And QW down here is Q waiting, which I'm sure you're all familiar with the numbers. Right? <laughs> and hopefully R. Yeah. Yeah. R is where we want them all to be, but I don't want to get there. And a lot of the uh, capital R Q and something like that um, is something that happened automatically. You never had to do it yourself. It was just you know, the note that was planned to be scheduled on got taken out for maintenance or something and it got rescheduled or something like that. Anything else? Take take, take five and then uh, Adam will be talking about Hadoop, I believe. Yep, I got a couple of things first, but yeah, we're okay, sure. definitely getting there. Very good.